so I'm, I'm uh, having a specific recording for this topic of why do I model? Um, last time we, uh, we saw um, some elements of that and uh, I gave some motivations as reflected in your, uh, your comments here. Um, we, we saw uh, a lot within that presentation, including different you know, sorts of models. Uh, we, we talked like about models that are aggregate that summarize the state of the population as a kind of a vector of counts. Uh, the number of people are susceptible, the number exposed, the number infected or as individuals. And we'll be going into this in great detail soon enough where each individual is governed as a situ situated actor in a given environment with limited perception around them enmeshed in networks and in geographic space often. Um, and I talked about a few of many uses that models um, help advance um, uh, when, when we use them. But I wanna dig into to this question about why do I, what do I model? Um, and, um, uh, and, and hit on some of the really big points that I hope will explicate some of the discussion we've just had. Um, so one reason I, I dynamically model, I'll model with these, these models that are simulation models over time is to learn more effectively about the world. Um, it's to, to more quickly identify cases where my understanding is off. Another is to, to, to make my assumptions shared and explicit so that they can be um, critiqued. This can start even with the most basic, what's called a model map, where we, um, where we sort of sketch the relationship between different things. Those who took my CMPD 371 course may recognize this as what's called a causal loop diagram. And here we put in factors um, um, that, are in some sense have polarity, bigger or lower amounts. And we have links between them, which are absolutely critical. Um, it's about the interconnections that drives, um, you know, a system's behavior to differ from its pieces. It's the interconnections between the pieces. And we, we put polarities associated with that. And based on these, we reason about the polarities for the system as a whole and what are called loops or, or feedback loops for them that are of central interest, as we'll see. And in the system dynamics uh, sphere of modeling. Um, uh, and you know, in other cases, we put down our assumptions, this is for an agent-based model, about how transplants work and you know, the types of dialysis that people can undergo and different levels of risk is something they're in and the stages they go through to be assessed for a transplant. We put our assumptions down in a model. Um, uh, this is in a different area for opioid abuse, for example, and we might characterize a person when it comes to motivations for action as being in one of a set of states here that are formalized in what's called the trans theoretical model or be, uh, stages of change model um, for, for behavior change. Um, and often we do this in a, in a visual way as the very first person spoke up so that we can communicate to others. And the reason that's so important is this model captures my assumptions about this situation. It captures kind of a, an operationalized theory, how I think the world might be operating. Um, I'm, I'm sort of taking some stance about this and saying, well, this is my working hypothesis often. You know, this, this is my best guess as to how it works. And by putting it in a visual form, I can get others to critique it and actually help build it. These are from one of many exercises that we've run with, with stakeholders to help contribute to building models or help criticizing them, um, help pointing out gaps. This is just operating with the model. We're not getting into simulation quite yet, but they're criticizing the structure. Where it gets really interesting is when you can also show them the simulation outputs from the model and say, does that jibe with your experience? Is, is what's coming out of this model which comes out of the logical consequences, the consistent understanding coming from this model. Is that, does that match up with what you see as a system stakeholder? These are leading experts from around Australia gathered to do exactly this in the diabetes and pregnancy area and, and subsequent diabetes. Um, and so, you know, they're, they can be used to give critique on the structure of the model, the assumptions, but also the behavior. And if both don't line up, we've got something 
that we have to fix. There's something we've learned. It's not a failure of the model, it's a success of learning that we've spotted this inconsistency between what the model gives and uh, what, um, what's known about the world, the empirical data. Um, so in models, we're, one of the big, big reasons we use them is we wanna simulate. And to do so, we need to make our assumptions precise and thereby testable. You know, I argued last time, it's not so much we have a crystal ball, but it's more like we have a prosthetic lab, right? It gives us nearly full function and be able to reason through the consequences of our models, um, of, of these sort of complex models uh, by, by offloading that from our heads into a computer, much like uh, an artificial lag uh, allows us to, even without a, a you know, a functioning left, left leg to, um, to operate with nearly full functionality. So models here are kind of, as my colleague Jeff McDonald um, in, in Sydney, Australia um, comments, models are thinking prostheses. Um, uh, they're, they're, this is a prosthesis, right? A cane, a crutch, a, a, an artificial leg, for example. And models are like cognitive um, prostheses. They help us learn more quickly by thinking through um, consistently, quickly, and thoroughly uh, the degree to which our theories match up with the empirical evidence. Um, and um, that's, it's hard to do when they're informal um, inside our heads, but a model lets us take a theory, a theory captured in something like this and run it forward and say, hey, does that jive with what we see empirically? Does that jive with the data we have? Does that jive with observations for people in the trenches? You know, these sort of folks here, does that jive with their experience? throughout Australia by observing, you know, the outcomes of people with, who experienced diabetes and pregnancy. Uh, that can allow us to more quickly figure out where our theory is off base. Where does it match? Where is it different? You know, to what degree does it line up and in what areas is it off base? So a given model will often have many lines of output that we're trying to jibe with empirical data. And if there's something off, even in one area of the model, often it ripples through to discrepancies in other areas. So you can, you know, it's kind of like you squeeze the balloon here, it pops out and, and many other places. Um, and the idea is, look, again, it's not that these models are correct. It's, it's um, that it's better, it's better to take a stance. As we say now in modern terms, fail early, fail often. Um, you know, it's, um, uh, we, we try to fail forward. We try to um, discover our mistakes sooner. Those who took 371 will recognize this is the same philosophy that good software engineers can apply to, you know, arrive at understanding of quality problems um, within their, their systems through peer reviews and through uh, testing and so on. Um, it's better to, you know, um, uh, put together uh, something that will uh, be our, our best understanding, get it quickly for stakeholder feedback in an agile way, get it quickly for test into testing and peer review to find a problem. With a model, we have this systematic way of, of replacing confusion by learning, by, by taking what our understanding is, putting it into a model and running it, and saying, hey, does that add up? And having people look at the model structure and say, no, that you're missing an asymptomatic state or, you know, wait a minute, we can find people who don't have symptoms by mass testing. You're missing a way of diagnosing people without symptoms. You can't assume people without symptoms are undiagnosed, et cetera. Um, so we can get challenged. And it's by being challenged, by being corrected that we learn and we advance our understanding and we refine our model. Um, so models help us sort of spot our, our cherished prejudices that just ain't so, um, and to advance our, our thinking. Um, so even putting forward a poor model initially gets us somewhere because we, we learn <laughs> and then we work towards a more savvy model, right? Um, Francis Bacon, the, the famous uh, philosopher and, and, and philosophy of science pioneer, once commented, truth will sooner, sooner come out of error than from confusion. Try something and learn from it. Posit something of a working hypothesis and work to test it in the crucible of evidence. Um, 
test it against what's actually observed rather than just saying, well, I don't know, and, and just kind of um, saying, you know, I'm not gonna say anything, I just have no clue. Um, fail early, fail often, fail forward, um, fail in a way that helps you learn. Um, another reason we model is look, we all make decisions based on some sort of model. Often though it's a mental model, it's a model in our head. Typically it's a mental model. It's a model of how we think things work out there. And, um, and by, for the really tricky questions, the gnarly questions, the wicked problems and, and problems that are complex, if we use computational models, we can challenge and sharpen those mental models. So we're always, you know, iterating, but if we have a, if we have a simulation model, we can more quickly test and, and debug our mental model. And we can undertake action in the world and see if the results jibe with our expectation. And this is exactly how our models are being used day in, day out, you know, since the inception of the pandemic um, for our decision makers. Um, sometimes in the Ministry of Health, always in the SHA, the, the, the health authority, um, day in, day out, testing what the model anticipates and testing out what's actually observed. We undertake a new strategy, a mass vaccination campaign for boosters, a rolling out among kids. We look what we expect from, you know, from the model and compare it with what we see from the world and we adjust the model assumptions day in, day out, week after week. And that's how we learn. And we've had similar strategies with worldwide stakeholders for our COVID-19 models. Um, another reason we model is to, you know, to leverage understanding data to what's going on, right? We have data from the world and we try to learn what it takes to explain that data. I've emphasized this, but for those who are in my um, course, the, leveraging this together with machine learning, CMPD-898 or the Fields Institute for Mathematical Research's version of that course, which is operating concurrently with this and um, the next classes tomorrow, will recognize that we can learn more quickly and effectively what's going on when we combine these dynamic models with machine learning models. Um, and part of the clue is in this age, we're moving towards a situation which is best known as systems data science, where we can take our models, our computational models, our, our, our models, uh, dynamic models, and we can automatically reground them over time in observations. We can automatically update their assumptions. We can automate some of that learning process. So the model is sharpened in its understanding and it's kept current with the latest evidence and able to look forward, taking into account the current situation as best the data um, allows it to infer together with model assumptions. And this can often help us estimate things like the number of undiagnosed infectives we can't otherwise see. It's like we take data from the world from many different angles, many different areas, and we put it all together into a single picture, just like a, a, a CT scan, a computer tomography machine like this, takes pictures from many different angles, many different lines of evidence, and puts them together into a 3D view. We can kind of put together a picture of what's going on with distributions over the number of people infected or the number of people recovered at a given time. So we can kind of guesstimate how many people are in each of these states in a way that as new data comes in, it refines it. Um, that's not covered well in the course, except um, you know maybe in the last lecture or two, I'll, I'll touch on that because we're in a, a whole new era in terms of our ability to undertake that. And some people in the class know because they're involved with the use of these sort of models on a daily basis to inform decision makers around Canada um, about the current situation. How many people are secretly infectious? We haven't found them yet. How many people are still exposed? How many people are there out there who are asymptomatic, et cetera? Um, but another big reason that we model, which was mentioned by someone in the chat is look, we model to ask what if questions and particular questions about our choices, our decisions. We wanna understand as best we can, what would the impacts of different choices be in terms of certain outcomes? 
Now, you have to be careful because, as Samaya um, pointed out, like you want to be careful about doing this right off the get-go with a model. If you, if you don't have some confidence in the model and you say, these are the outcome of the choices, we could rush off and do something rash, just like if we thought in our head in some musing way about what the choices are without grounding it in a lot of evidence and we rushed out to make a decision, we might be in a bad way. We might, we might make mistakes. But once you develop conviction in a model, that it accounts for a lot of different patterns, that it stands the test of critique of, of those who are most familiar with the system, those working at, as we say, at the coal face and in the in the uh, in the world, then we can start to use it to kind of you know probe what would the what would be the outcomes be of intervening here in the system or here of rolling out an expansion to our, our testing, of using antibody um, treatments for early stage symptomatics, of, of putting in place uh, a more aggressive contact tracing, of instituting you know, across all smartphone users in the province, uh, automated contact detection with someone who's known to be an infective. Um, you know, diagnose the effects of roll of much faster rollout of childhood vaccines or requiring all kids in school, 17 or less, to be to be vaccinated. We could ask these sort of questions with a model, and um, while the results are imperfect, they may be a lot better than just guessing off of our reasoning informally, um, off the seat of the pa our pants, so to speak. Um, so when trying to rely on informal reasoning, often it falls back down to politics and guesswork and, you know, people are, are very far off. If you start to use a model, you're coming closer and you can correct the model when you're off base and learn, learn, learn faster and faster and use that to project forward. Um, so we could say, you know, if we could lower the, the acute crowding situation in Northern communities, um, how would that impact the number of cases being seen across the province, for example? Or if we could help um, vaccinate all homeless individuals uh, who are willing to be vaccinated quickly, how much could we lower not only the spread of infection in homeless shelters, but the broader spread of infection to others in the community? And we have to be careful. Um, um, just was, as was mentioned earlier with uh, Sumaya's um, uh, comments, we want to use the model for the right purpose. We, we want to ask, look, um, uh, we want to ask about questions that it's fit to use for use, um, that it's a good match in terms of our confidence and the precision of it. If we're very early on, maybe we just want to confine ourselves to ask things like which interventions will tend to yield effects faster than others, um, or which might yield effects that are largest uh, in, in some realistic way, which, which are at least are competitive in that regard. But you know, as you get more evidence, you might, you might want to um, ask more detailed questions. And I'll be uh, with you in just a moment, Moise. Um, you know, will this uh, change yield a net gain or loss? Um, is, is intervention A likely to yield a bigger gain than B or a lesser gain? These take more data. They take more precision in the model. They might take more confidence in the model, um, but uh, they start to address uh, some very practical questions. Um, and you know what? What's most challenging and often infeasible would be to say, "Look, given an intervention, given that I do X, how many people within one percent error am I going to see on each day?" Generally, that's a fool's errand. Like. For COVID-19, the number of infected people day to day, much less the number of reported cases, you don't know how many are gonna get off their duff and wait three hours in line for PCR testing, or if they get you know, a positive test and how many are gonna call in and stand by the long wait times to report their positive test result. Um, trying to, it'd be, you know, uh, at a certain point, models are just not up to it. We have great models of weather, but trying to use a model, a weather of model to know exactly, you know, at what minute of the day you're going to get snow in your backyard, that's a fool's errand. You know, it's, there's, 
it, it's not in the cards. You're going to get that any more so than the best hydrological model. And they're great ones. It's going to tell you exactly what time the waves are going to crest up and down hitting the university bridge. It ain't going to happen. It's just not in the cards. Does that mean it's not useful? No, it may be super useful to know, you know, roughly in what weeks the flooding risk is worse for a White Swan Drive across the river. Um, but it's not going to tell us, you know, the exact, uh, the exact minute when a certain house uh, basement is going to uh, develop an inch of water. Um, yes, so Moise, you had a question. Yeah, um, so my question is, um, having a model that's very confident, it's, it's, it's a good model, but how do you avoid overfitting it? Hmm. Generally, what we use here, and I'll be talked about this quite a bit, um, is in that sphere, you can use a, a technique that's known as cross-validation, um, where we essentially calibrate it, say, to data from a certain period of time, historically, where data is available. And we expect it to match up that. But then we use it to kind of predict for a period that's already happened, like the last three years, and make sure that it captures those patterns well, right? Um, if it's overfit, it might exactly account for the patterns of previous years, but there's no generality. It, it won't reproduce the more recent patterns because it wasn't told about them. But if it's, if it's solid, if it's not overfit to the earlier ones, we might expect that, it, look, it's gonna account for both sets of patterns quite well. So that's one of the ways we deal with uh, that challenge. Another way is you can perform cross-validation. You hold some data out from the model. You build the model with the knowledge of a large fraction of the data, but there's some data you don't tell it when building it. And you expect it to generate that, to tell you what that data you know, is, um, like what values it is you're not telling it about. So you sort of quiz it. You know, can it anticipate these values that weren't used to actually, you know, structure the assumptions uh, for that model? Hope that's helpful. Yep. Yeah. Um, okay. So, like, this was one of the graphs that the Minister of Health looked at in the, it may have been before the pandemic was declared, um, you know, talking about um, the effects of when to intervene in the pandemic. And one of the points is, look, if you intervene later, if you take action later, it actually brings the peak sooner and it makes it worse, okay? Um, and we had lots of graphs like this, like, okay, you could shut the borders, but all that does is defer. It doesn't so much make the peak less, right? It, it buys you a bit of time, but it's gonna come in eventually anyway, and then you're gonna have to deal with its consequences. Um, this is from, um, so that, the, the, the health minister was presented with that as the deputy ministers, et cetera. Um, uh, you know, we could look at impacts of school closure and, and changing the number of people that can go as visitors to long-term care facilities for elderly people or closing workplaces and see, you know, what would the gain be with that? What, what would the health consequences be probabilistically versus if we, if we just did status quo, um, for example? Um, so, you know, we can ask about what if questions and in the opening two months of the pandemic, we ran dozens, uh, if not hundreds of these scenarios looking at, at different outcomes um, for this province. And at that time, the government, the ministry acted on them quite quickly within hours of our modeling presentations, successive modeling presentations, new measures were, were put into place that were recommended during the modeling presentations or, or in, helped inspired or the, they helped um, uh, you know, develop confidence that this would make sense. And if you wonder, if you want to know why our province did better early on, it was in large part because of that quick action. Unfortunately, that has not lasted um, at the ministerial level, although it has at the SHA level. Um, Another reason I, I model is to anticipate what's coming on. Um, this can be done with, with regular models, but also with models joined with machine learning. Um, often with models with join with machine learning, we can anticipate what's coming. This is kind of the present time here, um, the, the dotted line here. And you know, here we are 
and the models accounted for all these patterns till now. And this is it projecting forward. And this is actually what happened. So it knew, look, we're, this is going to go down. And then there's going to probably be another peak. It's a little bit late for when it expected it, um, but it knew there's going to be a peak after this. And, and then the further you go out, you know, the more uncertain it is about the exact number of cases. This is for um, measles, as I recall. Um, uh, it could have been for pertussis. Uh, similar down here, you know, even though we're in a period where there were very few cases, it knew, hey, a peak's coming. I'm expecting it any, any week now. It'll probably be of roughly this size, et cetera. Um, this is kind of where we are right now. And we know this is coming. Just like in, you know, in November or early December, we were warning, hey, there's a peak coming post Christmas peak, you know, and it's going to be a mixture of Delta. And then Omicron rushed on the scene. And we know, you know, this is going to be a really big issue, but it's probably not going to crest into February. Um, and, um, and, you know, we can advise uh, the health authority as well as the ministry of this. Now, this final reason is, is what I spoke about earlier. Often modeling is the least bad of the alternatives. You know, um, if we don't model, often we find ourselves working against the nature of things. Um, we don't understand the drivers for the, the, the factors that govern what we're encountering in the world. There's a lot of things in the world we don't control, but what we do control often is our vulnerability to them. Those who took 371 will recognize the comments there with things like risk management and so on. There, there's a lot of things in the world we can't control, but what we can do is lower our exposure to them. Um, and those things are often very much under our control. Prepare for them, help, help make it less serious if they do happen. We don't know exactly when that, and we can't stop eventually someone walking into the province with the first case of COVID-19 or a case of Omicron. Um, but what we can do is align things so we're better ready to respond to it. So we have a robust response. We can detect it more quickly um, and respond to it. We know how to better prevent it. We know how to more quickly detect it early. If that sounds like bug detection, it should for a reason. Um, so policy resistance is, is really in the cards if we don't um, behave in this way. We're, we often will end up being sort of trying to make something work um, without understanding what governs whether it will work or not. Models are about why do certain things work and taking advantage judiciously to undertake things that will tend to work. If we, if we don't understand how the world works, we may be beating our head against a wall um, or you know, working across purposes with the way things actually end up. So key take home messages that I wanted from last last time in this part of today um, uh, are simple. Um, uh, look, uh, uh, a lot of systems we deal with, a lot of the challenges we deal with from the small software project management to issues of you know, fighting climate change and environmental degradation and issues of antimicrobial resistance and you know, um, uh, the, the spread of disinformation and and misinformation and, and uh, victimization and bigotry. Um, these things that we're dealing with are, are, are reflections of complex systems. And complex systems are difficult to manage. We poke them here, they pop out there. We try to manage one area in isolation and it just, it, it's, it's impossible because we have side effects or it's influenced by other things outside of our control, et cetera. And dynamic modeling provides us these tools to represent, start to reason about, and start to reason about how to best manage or, or, or help um, work to help us um, judiciously interact with complex systems um, in the large and in the small. Um, so whether you're trying to uh, combat the scourge of Omicron, whether you're trying to combat the scourge of opioid-related overdoses and homelessness and mental health issues, if you're trying to help a company succeed in the marketplace, all these call for working with tools that help us grapple with the gnarly nature of these challenges. And models help express dynamic hypotheses, these kind of 
of often working hypotheses for what's going on in the world, what's driving what, how things work, what's going on out there in the most simple terms. Um, and they help us understand better what is going on by correcting our misunderstandings, finding that accounting for it this way just doesn't add up with the evidence. It uh, doesn't add up with the, the findings of those who have expertise by living and breathing in that system, by working in that system day in, day out. Um, and for many models, we bring in people who are experts, um, you know, so leading clinicians and uh, epidemiologists, uh, people who, who uh, work on the front lines of nursing and, and um, are running the ER system across the, uh, the country, like James Stempian, a key, key contributor to some of our modeling projects. But in other cases, we bring in people who might not even have a high school education, but are, have lived experience of this, you know, lived experience of, of living as a homeless person with addictions issues and finding stigmatization and finding the barriers through that. And we can capture these things in the models. These models are not just technocratic instruments. They're ways of, of capturing people's understanding and experience uh, in ways that can be broader and to grapple with the real issues, not just those we imagine from an ivory tower. And models help us understand how to improve things for the better, how to bend that curve, how to, how to make a difference uh, in the right way. Because often, you know, when people say we don't have time to do it right, they're somehow assuming we have time to do it wrong. And when it comes to saving money, when it comes to saving time, having the greatest effectiveness, greatest bang for the buck, you got to behave in a judicious way or you'll be working like King Canute against the, the nature of things or like his advisors urge. Models are, are specific to purpose. There is no one model of COVID-19 to rule them all. If we want to understand uh, long COVID effects in, in kids, um, uh, we'll often end up using a, a rather different model than if we wanted to understand how to lower the burden of of uh, COVID-19 infection in long-term care facilities or in homeless shelters. Um, different model yet than if we wanted to understand, you know, how the next variant might, might impact things in terms of broad numbers of cases and hospitalizations. Um, so models are specific to purpose, just like a map. Um, and there's multiple modeling types that are best suited for describing phenomena of certain types. And hybrid types allow us to kind of evolve the boundary for what we describe with one thing versus another. Just like in a software project, you might use JavaScript for part of it. You might use um, you know, Java for another part uh, and Haskell for another part. Um, models have strong limitations, um, but you know, at the end of the day, like democracy, they may be the least bad of the alternatives um, for many of our goals. Um, uh, because often we are deciding based on models. The question is, are they opaque? Are they shared? Are they open to critique? Are they able to be refined quickly? Are, they able to, are we able to spot the problems with them? And we don't know of a really better way to, to do this than with the tools of dynamic modeling, sometimes together with data science. Okay, so those are all my, my comments here. And I see Moise has a question, which is awesome. I, I welcome questions at all times from students. So Moise, yes. Sorry, Professor, my hand was still up from last time. I was oh, okay, all... residual hand, uh, hand hysteresis. Okay, um, no problem. Um, I do that all the time myself. Uh, so uh, thanks, uh, thanks for spotting that. Okay, um, any, anything people wanna ask or, or comment on before we dive into a whirlwind discussion of, um, Three, I don't know if we'll get through all today, major types of dynamic modeling. Anyone wanna ask about anything or, or bring issues up? Anyone troubled by anything or, or you know, puzzled by something? Um, I have a quick um, comment or question if I could interject. Excellent, yeah. Um, I guess it just uh, has to do with the AnyLogic software. Mm -hmm. The syllabus says 8.7.0. Um, will the 8.7.9 version suffice? It'll, it'll be fine. Um, uh, I, you know, I, I should have um, spotted that it was a bit too uh, specific. The deal with any logic is that um, um, 
two things. Uh, one thing is sometimes between even minor versions, there can be significant changes in functionality. Um, uh, and uh, so, um, you know, taking care to specify a certain version uh, can sometimes be important. The other thing though, is it has really bad um, uh, sort of, there's, there's a technical term for this, uh, um, but it, it tends to have bad sort of backwards compatibility in a certain sense. It's not, not quite the right term. If you save something with that version of the model and I'm running 8.7.4, any logical offense say like, I won't open your model. Um, and uh, so then I, I go to open it. It should be fine. I'm, I'm not gonna worry about that. If you start getting beyond 8.7, uh, I'll worry. And chances are we will have to on our side to, to mark the assignments and to look at your projects. I'll have to upgrade to 8.7.9 myself. But yeah, thanks for asking. I'd say within the 8.7s, you should be okay. Uh, don't go to 8.8 .8. Um, Yeah. okay? Thank you for asking. Anyone else want to bring something forward? No one? Okay. So 